Test, test, test. Okay, cool. All right, so next talk is the current and future state of Ethereum by uh, Aiden Hyman. Okay, hi everyone, how's it going? My name is Aiden Hyman. I'm a co-founder and CEO of Chainsafe Systems. Um, so I was planning on talking about the current and future state of Ethereum, um, and then I saw the ladder. Okay, and then I saw the the schedule, and I saw that someone who's working on a, an ETH 2.0 client was actually talking before me. So I decided to kind of not make you all watch through that twice. So we're going to talk today about how to get started with Ethereum and to start building kind of scalable dApps today. Um, what on the layer two side of Ethereum is usable for you right now? So, I'm, so this is really geared towards developers that might have heard in the past that Ethereum doesn't scale and doesn't work and everyone's trying to kill it. So uh, well, yeah, I'm going to try and kind of provide a different um, source of information on the current state of Ethereum. Um, so a little bit about us um, in Chain Safe Systems. We're a 23-person uh, blockchain research and development shop. Um, we only do work, though, on uh, Ethereum. And uh, recently, we've started working on Polkadot. Um, so these are our projects that we're currently working on. They're all fully open source. You can check them out at github.com slash chainsafesystems. Um, it's all there. Uh, yeah, so Lodestar is a beacon chain client. Uh, in TypeScript that we're working on. Um, the beacon chain is one of the kind of parts of Ethereum 2.0. It should be live in three years. Um, so yeah, not, not really usable by developers right now. Um, the Go PRE, so that is a, a project that we just announced a couple days ago and we're really proud to be working on it. Um, a, a PRE is a Polkadot runtime environment. So basically, this would be a piece of software that would allow you to, in Go, build parachains and other types of blockchains that could, or not necessarily, but could be a part of the Polkadot ecosystem. Um, so that's a kind of, uh, yeah, a different blockchain that I'm going to be talking about today. Um, then we have Chainbridge, uh, which basically allows individuals to have EVM to EVM token transfers. Um, or EVM to EVM to EVM. So the EVM is the Ethereum virtual machine. Um, and so this would allow you to basically transfer data, which is basically a token, across these blockchains, however you deem necessary. Um, WayPay is a uh, mobile, cross-platform mobile wallet. Um, we kind of, in working with different people found that a lot of these wallet providers, even if they're open source, they cha charge exorbitant amounts of money to get people's tokens listed. Um, so we decided to, yeah, kind of get rid of that business model for people and make it completely open source. Um, it's in React Native, so really easy for people to kind of get involved with and contribute to, um, to target both kind of uh, iOS and Android at the same time. Um, we then have Dnode, which is a full node incentivization mechanism. Um, though we talk a lot about decentralization in the blockchain world, we don't really talk about where that decentralization is coming from. So Dnode attempts to solve that by trying to incentivize people to run their own full nodes. Uh, right now, that doesn't really happen. And unfortunately, that means that uh, service providers are kind of allowing people to have endpoints for free or for a charge um, but that obviously doesn't allow you to actually build up the infrastructure of the blockchain and instead kind of lets you kind of do it in an easier way, but also in a way that um, almost uh, is contradictory to the whole ethos of blockchain in the first place. Um, we then have ETH Local, which is, sorry if this is boring anyone, ETH Local, which I'm just trying to explain my background so you see why I think this matters. Um, ETH Local is a basically... Uh, uh, a, a module and CLI that allows you to decide what your key management kind of looks like within a decentralized application. Right now, in terms of user experience, we're really stuck with something called MetaMask in the Ethereum world, which is an uh, uh, extension to your browser, and that basically manages all your keys. Um, we believe that developers should decide the own UX of their uh, dApps, 
And so we built this to allow people to, if they want, build an, a browser extension, or if they want, do whatever they want to do. Um, and so that's what that tries to do. Um, the Gurley testnet is a testnet that we're really proud to have launched uh, also a couple days ago with Afri over here. Um, and yeah, the Gurley testnet is the first cr cross-client proof of authority testnet. Um, the reason that matters is because uh, in testing contracts, traditionally uh, POA, which is proof of authority, which is kind of the easiest testing uh, consensus mechanism, um, traditionally these things uh, were restricted to different clients and so there was no, no interoperability amongst this and so you know you weren't able to test certain things even on the client side in the, on the test net um, and so this for example made certain clients more robust in the testing that they were able to do uh, than for the main net and just a couple little things like that um, and then Ringo which is a project that uh, my colleague Elizabeth uh, works on through a grant by the Ethereum Foundation, and basically that looks to bring ring sign signatures to the Ethereum blockchain. Um, this would be done through adding a precompile that would allow for the arithmetic necessary to be done to be able to be done in a cheaper way. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, so Ethereum currently is an account-based blockchain, um, unlike Bitcoin, which is UTXO-based, and it's a proof-of-work blockchain that has an Ethereum virtual machine. Um, so that's just a couple little things to consider when talking about Ethereum. Um, and within that, there are two kind of layers. There's layer one and then layer two. Um, layer one is the core of Ethereum. Um, and it's restricted to the amount of transactions per second you can actually fit in a block. Um, and any changes to that uh, require a hard fork. So, I mean, you need the entire community, basically, to decide, okay, this is something we agree on, and then we agree on it, and we move forward. Um, so, what does kind of layer one look like? This is a little screen grab. I'm not sure if you can all see it, but basically, I was trying to say, hey, there are this many transactions per block, and then I kind of started looking at it uh, and realized more and more how I would be lying to you all if I didn't just show it to you. Um, so, as you can see, uh, there's a five second block, a 52 second block, there's a whole bunch of different um, times in which these blocks have been finalized, um, mostly due to kind of different uh, things within the network itself. But basically what it looks like is about a 17 second block time currently, um, with around, yeah, as you can see, around 150, 100 uh, transactions um, per, per block. Um, just to give you kind of an idea, there's 8 million gas in a block and then 21,000 uh, gas per, for a, single, uh, a, uh, a very simple transaction of one ether, to another, uh, one ether from one address to another. Um, this is the current chain data uh, size of the Ethereum blockchain. As you can see, it's not that large. Um, it's only really 130-something gigabyte, which really is in an incredible feat. Um, it's something that people like to complain about. Um, which yeah, I'm, not too, I'm not too sure why. It's mostly due to kind of, I think, misunderstanding over what an archive node is and a full node. Um, this would be a full node, so this would allow you to um, get whatever information you need and unpack that data to get an archive node. Um, and so what does scaling layer one look like? Um, it looks like sharding in Casper FFG, the friendly finality gadget. Um, I, I'm, hoping more of this was discussed in, earlier, in the earlier talk, and so I will not be talking about this too much. But basically, these two together um, bring us the beacon chain, which is that Ethereum 2.0, ETH 2.0 um, release that's happening in about three years. Um, so we're talking about layer two. Um, layer two really has, and it has more than this, but the two main things we focus on are state channels and plasma chains. Um, so there's a distinct difference between the two, and we'll kind of explore that and also look at examples of tools you can use today to spin up state channels, spin up plasma chains, and even integrate them to pre-existing applications that you are all working on. Um, so what is this layer two thing? Well, it's defined as the layer above the base protocol, and it's reliant on security guarantees from layer one. Now, the reason the second part is really important to consider is that a lot of these layer two or all of these layer two scaling solutions, they require for you to be able to kind of rebalance the state of accounting on the mainnet. So if we're not able to do that,
because the blockchain is clogged on the on layer one, meaning too many transactions are uh, trying to kind of go through the network at once, we might actually not be able to um, reconcile that kind of layer two uh, uh, solution. So yeah, it, it does require both layer one and two working together and scaling together, um, but we can still do a lot right now with the technology that exists. So to kind of define state channels, um, Jeff Coleman, who's also from Toronto, uh, wrote something in 2015 that I honestly think is the best kind of explanation of what a state channel is. I could never begin to do it as well as him. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll put it up here. So it's a three-part thing. So part of the blockchain state is locked via a multi-sig or some kind of smart contract so that a specific set of participants must completely agree with each other to update it. Now, what does that really mean? That means that we all put kind of this thing, we all agree to this multi-signature and agree to terms um, in which kind of those funds or whatever it is we agreed on um, can be kind of changed. So whatever we agree on at the beginning in terms of what allows for that state to then change, um, kind of we do that from the beginning. Um, so number two, participants update the state amongst themselves by constructing and signing transactions that could be submitted to the blockchain, but instead of merely held, instead are merely held onto for now. Each new update trumps previous updates. What this means is that basically every time we have an off-chain, like state channel transaction that's occurring, what we're doing is signing it in a way in which it can be reconciled on layer one. It does not need to be because we're all in agreement and we're all okay with what's going on, but we can at any moment take that information and then reconcile it on layer one without the permission of anyone. And that's a really important feature of this. And number three, finally, participants submit the state back to the blockchain, which closes the state channel and unlocks the state again, usually in a different configuration than before. Um, this one is a bit more simple. Um, basically, it's this idea of closing a channel and what that kind of looks like is basically grabbing that state and uh, going to number one that we talked about and uh, meeting the requirements of what we decided at, to do um, and then unlocking those funds and allowing them to kind of be sent to whoever needs to be sent. So, you know, we might have had 10,000 transactions off-chain, 1,000, whatever the amount off-chain, we're now able to go on-chain and make sure that those funds go to whoever they need to go to. Um, and I got that here, so if anyone cares to read more about this, this is from 2015. Um, I, would, yeah, I would definitely read his blog post on state channels. Two really good, you can't really see the one on the left, but two what I think are the best examples of current live state channels that you could start working with today are Raiden and the Connects network. So you, you still can't, I don't know if you can see, but uh, Raiden, I'll make sure this is plugged in. Raiden is an incredible project. Um, and what they allow you to do is open, top up, close, and then settle these payment channels. So similarly to what we talked about before. Um, but what's amazing about this is that you can automatically join one of these networks and open these channels with peers off through their kind of, throughout their network. And the amazing thing for developers that aren't necessarily blockchain savvy is that they open up, they have a REST API with endpoints for all the functionality that you can find within the contracts, within the network, within anything. So it's all there for you. And again, you do not know, need to know anything about the blockchain for this really to be able to be integrated into something you're building. Um, they have a, an explorer, so you can actually see everything that's happening in the network. Um, it's recoverable in case of an irregular shutdown of the Raiden node, which would be a node that's running on top of the Ethereum blockchain itself. Um, and they use ma matrix for communication. Um, if you're looking to get started with Raiden, start by reading the docs. They just went to the mainnet with Red Eyes, their new release. Um, and it's incredibly exciting and a really good time to start playing around with it. As, yeah, this is very new technology that's only starting right now. Um, in the past couple weeks to really uh, be there for people to play with. Another example is Connects Network. Um, Connects 
custodial payment channels are actually being used in Spank Chain, which is a project that might have used, uh, that some of you might be familiar with. Um, so Connext is, yeah, it's live right now with uh, custodial hubs. So what does that look like? Well, that looks like something like around this, where you have two spokes, maybe two individuals, and then someone else acting as a custodian, as a hub. And so I do not need to open up a channel with the second spoke. Instead, what I do is have a channel open with the hub. The other person has a channel open with the hub. And so we're able to interact through the hub to send transactions to one another, uh, meaning we do not have to have channels open with each other, which saves us a lot of computation in that, um, yeah, anyone can have a channel open with the hub and send a transaction through there to another person. Um, so it's really, uh, really useful. And if you're looking to get started, um, yeah, check out their GitHub. It's all there and incredibly uh, easy to play with. Um, if you're looking to learn more about state channels in general, um, learnchannels.org is an incredible uh, resource for anyone to kind of be able to get their hands dirty. Moving over to Plasma. Um, so I, I like Plasma a bit more because I find it a bit more uh, exciting. And it's because instead of state being updated, it's more about uh, like the transition of state itself, similarly to the Ethereum virtual machine. It's more about the transition than the actual state. Um, this, was uh, this paper was written by Joseph Poon and Vitalik Buterin, um, and it's called From the, From the Plasma, Scalable Autonomous Smart Contracts. Um, incredible paper, available at plasma.io. So, yeah, there's a small little definition that I, I got from there. So, Plasma is a proposed framework for incentivized and enforced execution of smart contracts which is scalable to a significant amount of state updates per second, enabling the blockchain to be able to represent a significant amount of decentralized financial applications worldwide. Just to put this into perspective, if you go to ETH Research, which is an amazing resource for where most of the Ethereum research happens in the world, uh, what you'll be able to see is that people are now working on a whole array of plasma chains. One, for example, that's been talked about is you know, one made specifically for decentralized exchanges. Why that's so exciting is that you can now make these plasma chains that have the specific uh, instruction sets necessary to achieve the, uh, what you want to achieve. We were recently at a hackathon in Singapore and someone worked on a zero knowledge plasma chain. So these really allow you to do whatever it is you need to do for a specific application while utilizing the security of the Ethereum mainnet. Um, so yeah, the, these smart contracts are incentivized to continue operation automatically via network transaction fees, which is ultimately reliant upon the underlying blockchain to enforce uh, transactional state transitions. This goes back to the earlier uh, point I made where, you know, though layer two is super exciting, uh, layer one still needs to scale to allow for these things to make sense. Because at the end of the day, if you cannot rectify that balance on the mainnet, really you've done nothing but lose your money in a contract and then gone and done something with it on the side. <laughs> um, so this is kind of what the relationship looks like between the root chain, which would be Ethereum, and then the child chain, which there could be you know, an N amount of. And so that's the whole point. If you want to learn more about Plasma, check out plasma.io. And then similarly to Learn Channels, there's learnplasma.org, which again, <laughs> Um, it's absolutely incredible that these resources exist now, which they didn't two years ago, a year ago. Um, so Plasma Group just uh, got announced maybe a week ago, maybe less. And what they allow you to do is uh, have a command line wallet, uh, the Plasma operator software, a Node.js client, and a block explorer. Why this is amazing is that simply with these three uh, terminal inputs, you could get a plasma chain deployed on your machine right now. Um, and that's an incredible feat. It might not sound too exciting, um, but this is something that's been worked towards as a goal in Ethereum for years. Um, and it's finally possible today. Um, so if you have been considering in the past playing with Ethereum and you were kind of blown away by how ridiculous gas costs are or, you know, 
things that didn't really make sense from a privacy perspective, um, please do check this out because um, this could potentially be the solution to building what it is you want to build on top of Ethereum. Um, yeah, this go, just go to Plasma.group to, to read more about them. Um, and then one thing that I have to mention, because a lot of our work is building these side chains and then bridging them to the mainnet. So basically allowing uh, these side chains to interact with Ethereum itself. Um, so something that you know, people don't always consider layer two are these side chains themselves. Um, and so what that is is usually a fork of Ethereum and it's optimized for a specific use case but it relies on interoperability through a bridge. So it's this bridge that looks something like this that allows you to deposit something on the root chain and then withdraw it on the side chain or vice versa, whatever the case needs to be. An amazing example of a side chain is, the P is XDAI, which is a, a joint project by the POA network and MakerDAO. So quickly, I don't have really time for this, but what DAI is is a pegged uh, token that allows for um, yeah, a token to remain stable by, while remaining the most decentralized as possible uh, with today's technology. Um, and so if you do something called a CDP and you basically mark, uh, leverage you know, two-thirds of Ether to get a one-third in DAI. Um, so it's an incredible project that, again, if you're looking to integrate some kind of token to your project, um, you don't really need to because they've allowed you to have a stable token that really meets uh, the demands of users because there's nothing worse than, um, like, for example, when we go to hackathons and give people their prizes, and now a year later those prizes are almost worthless, um, we would have rather been giving people die like we receive when we get grants. Um, so yeah, I'm not going to read too much into this, but basically why I thought that was important is because uh, DAI itself allows for application developers to think about blockchains in a really different way. Um, yeah, that's basically it. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks so much.